We're honored to have with us right now the representative from the great state of Wyoming who was removed from her leadership position for speaking out the truth, for speaking the truth in regards to the 2020 election and the insurrection on January the 6th. She joins us right now on the New Hampshire Today Show. She is Liz Cheney. Congresswoman, how are you? Hey, Chris. I'm doing great, thanks. How are you? Great. Appreciate you taking some time uh, to join us here in the Granite State. I want to start with your upshot on what you feel that this decision that was made by Kevin McCarthy and your colleagues in the House will mean for the Republican Party moving forward and the immediate fallout from this. Do you feel that this is going to create an environment where there's going to be less ability to have success in the 2022 and 2024 elections? Well, I think, Chris, that, that for the Republican Party to be able to prevail, um, we have to attract back voters who left us in 2020. And to do that, we've really got to be willing to take a hard look at what happened in 2020. So from a political perspective, uh, we clearly have to be in a position where we can convince people, you know, we are competent conservatives, you can trust us. We will be responsible with the, you know, authority uh, that you you give us if you vote for us and and help us take back the majority in the House and the Senate and get the White House in 24. So politically, we we've got to attract people back to the party. Um, but even more importantly, we have a constitutional issue, and a fundamental constitutional issue has to be above partisanship and, and above politics, and that is. We all have to have, I believe, a reverence for the rule of law. Uh, we have to be willing to say the 2020 election was not stolen and the former president is lying when he tells you it was. Uh, and, and we've got to be willing to embrace the Constitution and, and not the big lie. Was there any behind-the-scenes talk with Kevin McCarthy where he said, here, if you're asked about you know, this election, just pivot on to Joe Biden. Was there any attempt there to, to kind of silence you, to get you to, to play along, to keep your leadership position, or did everything play out the way that it appears in the public setting? Well, I think once Leader McCarthy changed his view, or at least changed what he was saying publicly about January 6th, and, and once he went to Mar-a-Lago and, and rehabilitated the former president, um, you know, it became very difficult because we had a situation where, uh, you know, after having said very clearly that the former president was responsible for the attack on the 6th and um, that, you know, he uh, should have stopped the attack once it was underway, which which was correct, um, you know, he moved off of that. And, and the trip to Mar-a-Lago to sort of rehabilitate the former president was, um, was a, a surprising moment given what we all knew the former president had done. And And so I think, you know, beginning there, uh, it became a very difficult situation, and you know I'm I'm not willing to um, you know help to enable or uh, be complicit in in the lies, and that is you know because they're lies and because they're fundamentally dangerous to the democracy. So if, if you suggest that that our electoral process is not going to give you an accurate reflection of the will of the people, um, then you you really are. Um, causing damage to the foundations of the republic and i think it's very important for us to to be clear that the republican party is a party of truth we're not a party of lies and we won't uh, we won't facilitate that president trump in his little uh, digital diary thingy he said the following liz cheney is a bitter horrible human being uh, no personality <laughs> or heart how much of it do you think plays with um gender and do you think that he would be as hard on a male as he is on a strong republican female well i mean listen I, i'm i'm the mother of five and so i could could tell you with you know some experience that you know when you when you hear things like that it reminds me of you know sort of the, the rantings of an angry 12 year old um but look i think the the american people uh, particularly given the challenges that we're facing today here at home and internationally, deserve to have two parties that will have debates about the issues. And, and as Republicans, we better be in a position where we know our ideas are better and that we're going to prevail on substance. And I think that's really what people want. They want us to get back to vigorous, strong debate about substance and policy um, and, and understanding, though, that our political opponents are not our enemies. Um, you know, we, we can have those vigorous debates, but 
uh, we need to get away from the vitriol that certainly has characterized a lot of the last four years. So I watched your interviews with interest uh, with Savannah Guffrey yesterday on the Today Show, also Brett Baer on Fox News, and I, I seem to get some ambiguity and mixed messages in regards to the presidency. Now, certainly your appearance here on the show, in my view, indicates that it is a interest. We're a New Hampshire radio station. You're a representative from Wyoming, etc. So is there interest uh, in your view, and it's down the road, is there interest in pursuing the presidency and seeing if you can pull together the type of coalition to be competitive in a race? You know, what I am focused on uh, right now is very much helping to rebuild the party and, and making sure that those people out there who may have left the party or who are still in the party but who are feeling despondent about the direction that the former president is dragging us down, that those people know that we are going to have a strong party. and. And so I'm, I'm really focused on substance. I'm focused on what we need to do to, to continue to rebuild our defense, what we need to do to fight against these policies that are going to raise taxes and expand the size of the federal government. Uh, that, that is my focus. My focus is my reelection in 2022 in Wyoming. Um, and, and so that, that's really how I'm going to be spending my time. And, and I do think it's, it's a national effort to make sure that, that, you know, Republicans around the country know they ought to stick with us. Um, that, that there are people in the party who, who, you know, are going to embrace the truth and be faithful to the Constitution and, and fight for the kinds of ideals that, you know, characterized our party in the days of Ronald Reagan, for example. But it is not something that you're ruling out, correct? It, listen, I'm, it's not something I'm focused on. I'm yeah. not, I'm not I, ruling anything in or out. I have the breaking news sound effect ready. If you want to just to announce your candidacy, <laughs> Congress will be there. Feel yeah, three years right. out. You could maybe yeah. challenge John Delaney's record yeah, for the earliest presidential super, super announcement. Helpful. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's fine. We'll, we'll wait, and we'll, we'll have you on again and talk about it another time and press you a little bit more. Um, in regards Great. to infrastructure, the president has said that he wants to engage in bipartisan discussions, and there's a significant difference between where Republicans are at and where, obviously, Democrats are at on this spending issue. Do you think that President Biden is being honest with the fact that he wants this to be a bipartisan process? Uh, you know, I think we've heard those, uh, we've heard those, those words. We've, we've seen the White House and the President say that they want bipartisanship. Unfortunately, we haven't seen any evidence to date that they're actually willing to incorporate any Republican ideas. And so I think, you know, a number of us have had discussions with people at the White House uh, about the key parts of the infrastructure, uh, bill that could have bipartisan support, you know, rural broadband, for example. Um, it's not dissimilar from the process we went through with the 1.9 trillion COVID mm -hmm. package where there were issues that we could come to agreement on, you know, vaccines, for example, PPP program. There were things that we all knew needed to be done. And the Democrats would tell us, oh, yes, we want to work in a bipartisan fashion, but then none of our ideas would ever get into the product. So, you know, I think in this situation, uh, there's real concern. I, I have deep concern about the amount of money that we've been appropriating. You know, we, the $1.9 trillion package, I, I think we had maybe an hour of debate. You know, it was under special rules, no, no real committee time, no amendments, no markups. That's not how Congress should operate. And uh, I think there, we're already beginning to see inflationary pressures. Um, when you inject this much money into the economy this quickly, um, you know, you, you, you have to realize that you're going to have some negative consequences. Obviously, the debt. Uh, soaring out of control, uh, and of course the the Chinese uh, Communist Party and the government of China holds um, a significant portion of that debt. So, I I really think that you know we are unfortunately going to see some pretty far left priorities and wish list items that the Democrats may may be trying to just sort of ram through, thinking they got to get as much done as they can, you know, before we get too close to the next election cycle and, and their moderate members start to get worried about reelection. Two more things before we let you go. One, I want to ask you about what this has been like on a personal level to have this type of, of vitriol coming your way, but also you know, the type of support that you receive from individuals that you would not normally expect to receive support from based upon the stand that you have taken. And you have taken a stand here, which is going to be remembered in, in history books. Um, we're still living in these these times, so it's very difficult to, you know, to kind of parse the history from you know, the common everyday occurrences. But 
What has it been like? Has it been invigorating? Have there been moments of, um, you know, trepidation? How would you describe from on a personal level what taking this stand has been like for you? You know, I mean, it, it's been um, uh, m moments, many moments of real clarity. Uh, I think, you know, clarity about about what my duty is, what I believe all of our duty is, um, clarity that's based upon the experience that I've had, you know, in part working overseas in places where they don't have a peaceful transition of power, um, you know, understanding that, you know, I, this wasn't, there was no choice here. You know, it's very clear to me what's required in terms of, fidelity to the Constitution, and also understanding the danger. You know, uh, it doesn't matter what you think about Donald Trump's policies. You know, I voted with him 93% of the time when he was the president, but January 6th was a line that can never be crossed. And we, we can't, you know, I, I did look at this a lot as a mother, too, and, and my children, and, and, you know, having the realization that, that I grew up in a country where we knew we would have a peaceful transition of power. And I'm going to do, you know, a absolutely everything in my power to make sure that that's, that's the country that we hand off to our kids. And we can't look away from January 6th, and we can't embolden the kind of lies that undermine our democracy. Final thing is on, you know, the new age of warfare and foreign policy. And, you know, we saw President Biden yesterday say that Vladimir Putin and the Russians were not directly involved in the hack on the Colonial Pipeline. But... This raises a large concern about where warfare is headed, in my view. Yeah. And to me, we are headed to an environment of, of germ warfare, as we are still you know, looking for complete clarity in regards to COVID-19 and its origins, a place of electromagnetic warfare and, obviously, of cyber warfare. And it appears that we have been preparing for many years for the battles of the past as opposed to looking towards the future. Your thoughts on that general assumption that I just made? And also, you know, are we prepared for the battles of the future, and how do we get prepared? Well, that, you, you've really put your finger on something that's very important. I think both with respect to cybersecurity and uh, what we see in terms of the colonial pipeline hack, uh, we've got to be much better prepared than we are. We've got to be able to be in a position where we're on offense with respect to cyber, as well as being very clear in terms of our deterrent, being able to say to anybody that might think that they can undertake that kind of an attack that there will be price a price to pay, that you know we're able to attribute those kinds of attacks, uh, and that, that we hold people accountable, and that we hold governments accountable who uh, help to facilitate those attacks. Um, we certainly do have to change the way that the Department of Defense operates. We have to orient the department towards these new threats. There's two really important uh, reports that have come out in the last uh, year or so. One is the Solarium Commission on Cyber, which I would recommend to all your listeners, um, a bipartisan commission in Congress really looking at what we need to do to in improve our ability to protect ourselves. The other one is a National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence report that came out about a month, two months ago. Um, bipartisan also, this was headed by Eric Schmidt and, and Bob Work, really looking at artificial intelligence. What does it mean? How do we defend ourselves? What, you know, it's, it's thinking through things like what happens if the Chinese government decides that they're going to allow machines to launch nuclear weapons instead of, you know, requiring a human being uh, in, in that chain. Uh, and that's just sort of scratching the surface, but it is a whole new world. Uh, we have to make sure we devote sufficient resources to our defense. We cannot cut cut the defense budget in ways that seems like we're headed towards. Um, and we've got to make sure that it's focused on the right things. And that's, that's going to be a big part of what we're doing on the Armed Services Committee over the next couple of months. Congresswoman, thank you so much for your time. Look forward to uh, talking again, and uh, best of luck. Thanks very much, Chris. Great to be with you. Great.